Welcome to WinCare Basics for Nursing Students. This presentation may be helpful if you're preparing to care for an assigned patient with a wound. Most facilities have a wound care nurse, but sometimes the attending bedside nurse must perform wound care. That attending nurse is the focus of this presentation. At the time of the creation of this presentation, I've held a wound care certification from the Wound Ostomy Continence Nurses Society since 2012 performing wound care in the pediatric population with patients from preemie to early 20s. This presentation for nursing students is also appropriate for attending nurses who are expected to perform non-complex wound care procedures. This presentation will not cover tunneling, undermining, burns, or specific types of wounds. Information on treatment for specific types of wounds can be found on the web pages that I'm mentioning in this presentation and noted on the last page of this presentation. I hold no interest in any of the companies that manufacture the products specifically mentioned in this presentation. Here's some important information before we get started. All wound care done in a healthcare facility needs to have wound care orders signed by a care provider. In an acute care facility, most wound care is done by a professional certified wound care nurse. However, the attending nurse may have to follow the wound care orders and perform dressing changes. The wound care nurse will likely measure the wound and take a picture of the wound weekly. This is generally not expected of the attending nurse. The wound care nurse should specify in the wound care orders or wound care progress note how often the wound care nurse will see the patient for wound care and will specify that the attending nurse will do dressing changes otherwise per wound care orders. Here's some skin anatomy basics. There's basically three layers to the skin. There's the epidermis, which is what you see. There's the dermis and then the hypodermis or most often called subcutaneous layer that contains the hair follicles, the blood vessels, the sweat glands. Let's talk about the epidermis first. It's the superficial top layer of the skin and carries the coloring of the skin. That's why if you get an abrasion that is pink, it will eventually, as it heals, turn to natural skin color over time. There may be hair growing with a superficial epidermal skin injury. Superficial wounds generally don't bleed. Examples of those are intact blisters where it's full of clear liquid or an abrasion that does not bleed. Superficial wounds may hurt because nerve endings can extend up into the epidermis from the dermis. <clears throat> Next is the dermis. The dermis is the thicker layer of skin just under the epidermis. The dermis contains blood vessels and nerve endings. That's why wounds that extend into the dermis may bleed and sting, such as road rash or deep abrasion. The dermis is connected to the lowest layer of skin by a wavy layer. This wavy layer consists of an upper papillary layer that adheres to the reticular lower layer, helping to hold the two layers together. This flattens out with age, leading to risk for skin tears as the two layers are easily torn apart. <clears throat> then the final layer, hypodermis or a subcutaneous layer. It is the deepest layer of the skin and contains, like I said, the sweat glands, hair follicles, and blood vessels. Any wound that extends into this layer will bleed, but the wound bed may not be painful, unlike the edges of the wound, which can be very painful. Yellow fat may be visible in the wound bed. This deeper wound will form granulation tissue and scar. Hair will not grow from a subcutaneous wound as the hair follicles will be destroyed. This may be the most significant for scalp wounds. There's two basic types of wounds then. There's the superficial to partial thickness wound. The depth is through the epidermis and possibly into the dermis, but not into the subcutaneous layer. And then there is a full thickness wound. The depth extends through the epidermis and the dermis into the subcutaneous layer. There will be scarring and loss of hair follicles and sweat glands in the scar. As you know, assessment is the beginning step of the nursing process. There are many wound assessment tools. However, in this presentation, we will simplify the process for the purpose of understanding the wound care treatment. A glance at some wound assessment tools will familiarize you with the terminology of wound care. 
Taking a closer look at the Bates-Jensen Wound Assessment Tool, we can see the components of comprehensive wound assessment. First of all, the size of the wound is measured, the depth of the wound. It describes the edge, undermining, necrotic tissue type, necrotic tissue amount, exudate type, skin color surrounding the wound, peripheral tissue edema, peripheral tissue induration, and granulation tissue and epithelialization. This depth of assessment is not expected of an attending nurse who is carrying out wound care orders. However, being familiar with these terms and knowing what is normal or expected for a wound is important. That's why it really helps to have a consistent person performing wound care as every wound is different and they will have familiarity with that wound. Alternatives are to study the wound care progress notes and view any pictures of the wound prior to wound care to compare and monitor the progress of healing. So let's talk about basic wound assessment. First of all, the amount of moisture in the wound is important to assess. Is it a wet wound or a dry wound? Moist healing environment is best for healing a wound. The goal is for moisture balance. Well, is there presence of dead or necrotic tissue in the wound? That's important to assess. Is there evidence of possible infection? That would be indicated by swelling or excessive exudate. What do, you, what, what do the wound edges look like? Are they flat and attached to the wound bed or are they rolled under, calloused or macerated? What about the skin around the wound? Is there redness and swelling or induration? So here are some basic principles for wound care to keep in mind. We want to achieve moisture balance. We want to remove non-viable tissue. We want to treat any infection, care for skin around the wound, which is the peri-wound skin, to prevent maceration or desiccation of wound edges. We want to choose a dressing that will promote those goals and we want to fill any depth of that wound. We want to make wound care as simple as possible for the caregivers. Here's a word about cleaning a wound. Most wounds are not sterile but must be cleaned with potable or drinkable tap water, not well water or sterile water or sterile saline. Although handy to use, there's no need for a special wound cleanser. Our first goal is to achieve moisture balance. A wet wound has indicators that the wound is too wet with excessive exudate or moisture if there is macerated skin around the wound, like soaking in a bathtub too long or getting pruny fingers. Soap dressings requiring dressing changes every few hours hypergranulation tissue that may even rise above the skin around the wound. Hypergranulation tissue may have other causes uh, rather than too much moisture. Whatever the cause, it's not good because it impairs the skin edge from advancing over the wound bed. Let's talk about care for a wound that is too wet. Change the dressing if you see moisture soaked through to the outside. That's called strike through. Use a dressing that is super absorbent that will not stick to the wound, such as Dratex or Quick, which are thick felt-like hydroconductive dressings. Refer to the wound dressing formula for your organization. Extra layers of gauze may work, but will not conduct fluid away as effectively as a hydroconductive dressing. Then you want to protect the surrounding peri-wound skin with a barrier film such as Cavalon or Marathon. Make sure they're completely dry before dressing application. Then you want to achieve moisture balance with a dry wound. Indicators that a wound is too dry. Well, the dressing sticks to the wound, causing bleeding or trauma when it's removed. That's why we need to soak off those dressings or the patient can take them off in a shower. The edges around the wound curl under or are unattached or stop advancing. The base of the wound is dry there may be a brown to dark red scab-like covering. It can even be like tough leather. This is called eschar and consists of dead and fibrous materials. This layer must be removed to allow healing. What about care for the wound that is too dry? Well, you want to add moisture by moistening gauze with sterile saline maybe, not dripping wet but significantly moist or add moisture by applying a wound gel if that product is available and on wound care protocols for your organization. 
You want to remove any non-viable tissue. As a registered nurse, you're not allowed to use a sharp instrument to debride or remove non-viable tissue from a wound. A surgeon or other care provider that has the privilege to perform shop debridement will have to be consulted to remove any stubborn or extensive non-viable tissue. Alternative methods of debridement include using an enzyme such as collagenase to liquefy the tissue, medical honey which draws fluid into the wound using the body's fluids to debride, and mechanical debridement using gauze or a sponge to remove the tissue, the dead tissue. Duoderm is a hydrocolloid that may be used for very effective debridement in wounds that are on the drier side. Next, you want to treat any infection or inflammation in that wound. For infection, perform a wound culture as ordered by the care provider. Wound cultures require that exudate or fluid from the wound is collected after cleaning the wound. This is done by pressing a sterile swab into the tissue and rolling it gently around the wound bed to press out the fluid onto the swab. Depending on the results, a topical or systemic anti-infective may be ordered. Keep in mind that medical honey and silver products do have effective antibiotic properties. If the wound has a fungal odor, an antifungal may be ordered. To treat inflammation, well, inflammation in a wound bed can lead to hypergranulation tissue that will impair healing. So you want to treat it. The care provider may order a topical or systemic anti-inflammatory such as a steroid cream, drops or injection. A product that contains both anti-effective and steroid may be effective in calming hypergranulation tissue. Silver nitrate can be used to knock down hypergranulation tissue in a wound, bed, or on the edges, but can also contribute to more inflammation. Elevating the wound area is going to help with some of the swelling if it's not contraindicated. Next, you want to fill any depth in the wound. A deep wound must be gently filled with dressings so that every surface of the wound bed is touching that dressing. Filling the wound bed is not packing tightly, but done to ensure that every surface of the wound bed is in contact with moisture or a wound care product that is to provide a specific role in healing that wound. Here is an example. Saline moistened gauze fluffed into a deep wound can be covered with a gauze topper. Medical honey or a wound gel can be placed in a wound bed and then covered with a dressing. In this picture, we have a green gauze called Sorbact. It's bunched up and moistened, and, or moistened with the body fluids as well, and that will protect, uh, touch every surface and add anti-infective protection. Then you want to care for the skin around the wound. Wound edges are important for migration of epithelial cells. Edges are either healthy, meaning they're flat and attached to the wound bed, or edges are unhealthy, meaning they're rolled under or calloused, impairing healing. You want to protect the wound edges from excessive moisture with a barrier film and protect the edges from dryness by balancing the moisture in the wound. A care provider may order silver nitrate application to a wound edge. That will cause sloughing and maybe restart the healing process. Dressings for wounds. At WoundSource.com, there is an excellent website for learning about dressings. If you go to WoundSource.com, you can click on Product Categories and then choose the dressings. Study the dressing categories to choose what best suits the wound for your goal achievement. Here I've chosen a foam dressing, and as that opens that window, you will see an overview of foam dressings, what they're used for, and their capability. And then there will be certain products listed that you can find out more about. It's a really excellent website. A word about securement of the dressing. There is a spectrum of ways to secure a dressing. Here's a few. You can tape it, wrap it, you can use a stockinette to make sure whatever you use that it allows for freedom of movement, it does not irritate the skin. Hair may need to be trimmed to promote adherence if it's a tape. In the case of a stockinette, make sure that it doesn't roll down or bind. It must not impair circulation or cause swelling from too much compression or being too tight. For example, 
never place tape circumferentially around an arm or a limb. As I said, WoundSource.com is an excellent source for comprehensive wound care information. Remember, you must have a care provider order for any wound care. For a comprehensive treatment order that will promote consistent care, include all of the following. The location of the wound, what cleansing solution will be used, the primary dressing that will be applied to the wound bed, that would be the type and size of dressing, or you could state the specific name of the dressing, and as needed, a moisture barrier for the peri-wound area to prevent maceration, and as needed, a secondary dressing to be placed over the primary one, also the type and size, and as needed, secure with tape, wrap, stockinette, whatever, and then the frequency of dressing change. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines or change more often based on exudate amount. The manufacturers will have a recommendation for when that dressing should be changed. Also, expected duration of the need for these dressings. Comprehensive wound care treatment order example might be cleanse right plantar ulcer with 30 milliliters of normal saline. Pat the peri wound dry with two dry gauze 4x4s. Apply Cavalon no sting barrier to wound perimeter. Apply santal ointment to nickel thickness on wound bed. Loosely fill undermined area and dead space with three fluffed saline moistened 4x4 gauze dressings. Cover with 6x6 composite dressing every day and PRN if loose or soiled for 14 days. This was written by Donna Sardina and is uh, visible on the woundcareadvisor.com website. Here's another example. Change sacral dressing BID. Use Hollister Medical Adhesive Remover to remove old dressing. Clean with sterile saline. Fill wound bed with sterile saline moistened curlix. Cover with two 4x4 gauze toppers. Secure with paper tape. Additional tips and wrap up. Always have a wound care provider order for any wound care. Make sure you have all the items needed at the bedside before starting care. Pre-medicate for expected pain per care provider orders. Consider use of uh, non-pharmaceutical distractions as well. Know your organization's policies on wound care and get familiar with available products. If the patient is to perform their own wound care, teach them progressively with dressing changes. Goes without saying, always wash your hands before care. Wear gloves, non-smeral in most cases. Wash your hands after care. Have the patient do the same, but they will not have to wear gloves for care most often. Hey, are you interested in wound care nursing? I hope so. You can become a wound care nurse. Go to the WOCN website, wocn.org, and look under Professional Development tab. There they will have information on accredited educational programs for wound care, also ostomy. Uh, and then you can go to the WOCNCB or the Certification Board website and find out specifically how to apply for certification and what is required. I have CWON, Certified Wound Ostomy Nurse. Good luck with your rotation and I hope that you found this helpful. Please email me with any comments or questions at pmclay2000 at gmail.com. Thanks.